looking at the contents. To understand the heart, we'll begin by seeing where it is. We tend to put the heart here in our imagination, but in reality, it's much closer to the midline. Seen from in front, the heart is here. It lies behind the sternum and directly above the diaphragm. Seen from the side, the heart is here, occupying almost all the space between the vertebral bodies behind and the sternum in the front. When the diaphragm moves, the heart moves with it. To get our first look at the heart, we'll start by removing the upper extremities and all the shoulder muscles that surround the upper thorax, so as to leave just the thorax itself, enclosed by the ribs and intercostal muscles. Then we'll remove this part of the ribcage on each side, revealing the lungs, which are fully inflated here. When we let the lungs deflate, we can see the heart behind the sternum, contained within its protective jacket of pericardium. To see it better, we'll take the lungs, the sternum and the pericardium out of the picture. This is the heart. This is the diaphragm. The major blood vessels that lead into and out of the heart take up almost as much space as the heart itself. Now that we've seen where the heart is, we'll take a detailed look at it. We'll look at its four chambers and its four valves. Then we'll look at the great vessels that enter and leave the heart. And lastly, we'll look at the coronary arteries. Because we so often see simplified diagrams of the heart like this, we tend to think the atria, the inlet chambers, are above, and the ventricles, the pumping chambers, are below. It's perhaps surprising to see that in reality, the atria aren't above the ventricles, they're behind them. Here's the heart in isolation. Here are the ventricles in front. Here are the atria behind. This generous coating of epicardial fat makes it hard to see the four chambers distinctly. To see them more clearly, we'll go to a heart in which almost all the fat has been removed. In this specimen, all four chambers have been distended with equal pressure, making the atria somewhat larger than normal. This is a directly posterior view of the heart. This is a directly anterior view. The massive thick-walled left ventricle projects forward and to the left. The thinner walled right ventricle is partially wrapped around the left one. We'll see the ventricles by themselves in a minute. For now, let's go around to the back and look at the two atria. This is the left atrium. This is the right atrium. Blood coming from the upper part of the body enters the right atrium by way of the superior vena cava. Blood coming from the lower part of the body enters it by way of the much larger inferior vena cava. In a more intact dissection, here's the inferior vena cava coming up through the diaphragm and almost immediately entering the right atrium. In addition to the two vena cavae, blood from the heart itself enters the right atrium under here by way of the coronary sinus, which we'll see later. From the upper part of the right atrium, this blind pouch, the right auricle or atrial appendage, projects forwards. The thin wall of the right atrium is formed largely of muscle. When the atrium contracts in diastole, the blood in it passes forwards into the right ventricle through the right atrioventricular valve or tricuspid valve, which is here. The left atrium and the right atrium are in contact here where they share a common wall, the interatrial septum, which lies quite obliquely. To look at the inside of the right atrium, we'll remove this part of its wall.
Here's the opening of the superior vena cava above and of the inferior vena cava below. Here's the opening of the coronary sinus. This is the part of the atrial wall that's shared with the left atrium, the interatrial septum. This thin oval patch in the septum is the fossa ovale, the remnant of the foramen ovale that connected the two atria in intrauterine life. Here we're looking forwards into the tricuspid valve. We'll see more of it when we look at the right ventricle. Now we'll move on to look at the left atrium. Blood coming from the lungs enters the left atrium by way of the four pulmonary veins, two from the right lung, two from the left. The left atrium, like the right one, has a blind pouch, the left auricle or atrial appendage, which projects upwards and forwards. In diastole, the blood that's in the left atrium passes forwards into the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular valve, or mitral valve, which is here. To see inside the left atrium, we'll remove this part of its wall. With the four pulmonary veins removed, the inside of the left atrium is relatively featureless. Here's the interatrial septum again, and here's the remnant of the foramen ovale, seen from the left side. Here we're looking forwards into the mitral valve. Now we'll move on to look at the two ventricles and their inlet valves. To see them clearly, we'll look at a heart in which the right and left atrium have been removed, leaving just the two ventricles. Here's the right ventricle, seen from the right side. Here's the left ventricle, seen from the front. Going round to the back, this is the right ventricle. This is the left one. They're separated by the interventricular septum, which is here. We're looking forwards into the wide open atrioventricular valve, the tricuspid on the right, the mitral on the left. On the right side, blood passes downwards and forwards to fill the right ventricle in diastole. Then, in systole, it passes upwards and to the left into the pulmonary trunk, passing through the pulmonary valve, which is here. On the left, blood also passes downwards and forwards to fill the ventricle, then gets turned completely around in systole, passing upwards and backwards into the aorta. It passes through the aortic valve, which is out of sight, here. To see inside the right ventricle, we'll remove this part of its wall. The tricuspid valve is here. We'll look at it in a minute. The pulmonary valve is up here. The anterior part of the right ventricle, the apex,